Okay, um, tonight I want to introduce you to our speaker. His name is K. Carl Smith. Uh, you've already heard uh, and read uh, through the email releases and Facebook uh, events and so forth some about him. But uh, K. Carl is a father and a grandfather, and uh, he's referred to as a defender of the Constitution and liberty. He's inspired by the guiding principles of the Founding Fathers, and he holds fast to the oath taken during his service to our country. Uh, he's a Frederick Douglass Republican, which he's going to tell us tonight what that is. But uh, he, um, to his credit, he, hold, he holds successful completion of both the airborne and air assault programs while on active duty in the U.S. Army. He's the former district leader of Americans for Fair Taxation. In 2009, he was appointed to the Amistad Commission by former Alabama Governor Bob Riley. He was reappointed to that commission where he currently serves. Additionally, he was recently appointed to the Affordable Homeowners Insurance Commission by Alabama Governor Robert Bentley. Uh, I really like this about him. He's referred to as a political agitator. <laughs> I think he's in good company here, isn't he? Kay Carl has appeared on the 700 Club, the Fox News Huckabee Show, and he was recently interviewed by Jenny Thomas for the Daily Caller and participated in a soon-to-be release. Well, actually, it has been released. Uh, production by uh, Reverend C.L. Bryant, The Runaway Slave. How many of you have seen that program, that movie, the documentary? It's an excellent one. Um, K. Carl has been featured in a myriad of publications to which he has been greatly hum humbled. The son of Colonel retired Ernest C. and Bessie Smith, uh, K. Carl is a native of Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and was reared in Huntsville, Alabama. He is a graduate of Alabama AM University and makes his home in Trustville, Alabama. K. Carl is a pr proud father of three children and five grandchildren. Please help me, six grandchildren, sorry. Uh, please help me welcome K. Carl Smith. Now, can you hear me? Thank you so much for the invitation to come to your community and to share a message of empowerment, share a message of something that we can do to save our beloved nation. And I thank you for coming. The message you're going to hear tonight is not a, what we need to do or what we ought to do as conservatives in order to save this country. It's a how-to. I think you would agree with me. There are some of those in this country that want to take our beloved nation and transform it into a European socialist communist country. They want to fundamentally transform our country. And they're serious about it, and they're playing for keeps. There are three challenges that I want to address tonight that's facing the conservative movement. And if the conservatives can't find an answer to these three challenges, we're toast. We'll never win the White House again, and we'll never preserve the blessings of liberty for our posterity. It'll never happen. The first challenge is this. We must find a way how to defeat the vile and the malicious attacks of the left wing. We must find a way how to defeat the vile and malicious attacks. They call us racists because we say we're conservatives. They call us Uncle Toms. And in the midst of doing that, they're discrediting us. So when we try to engage someone, we have already been discredited, so our message falls on deaf ears. We don't have a message problem. We have a messaging problem. The way in which we try to share our message falls on deaf ears. So we got to find a way how to trump the race card and defeat the class warfare attacks. Because they say that conservatives don't care about the poor, for example. That's challenge number one. Challenge number two is this. We must find a way how to inspire, not recruit, how to inspire more blacks, more Latinos, more Asians, more young people, and more women to join the ranks of the conservative movement. If not, we're toast. If we can't find an answer to this diversity inclusion problem, we will never win the White House again. Never. And we'll never save our nation. We gotta find an answer to those, those two challenges. And the last challenge is this. We must find a way how to energize the conservative base. Governor Romney received less votes from conservatives than Senator McCain. 
Those are the three major challenges. We're toast, we don't have an answer. We can't find an answer, we gotta hurry up. Before you leave the night, you'll have the answer to all three. Before you leave here tonight, you have the answer to all three. How to trump the race card, how to defeat the propaganda of the left. You're gonna learn how to defeat the propaganda. You're gonna learn how to inspire others to join the ranks of this movement, the conservative movement. Just read a Gallup poll survey about two weeks ago. It came out and said that 38% of Americans identify themselves as conservatives. Only 23% identify themselves as liberals. Most Americans then agree with us. This is a center-right nation. And since this is a center-right nation, why are we having such a, gift, a difficult time to bring in diversity into our midst? Why? The answer is propaganda. The answer is propaganda. Before I get into Frederick Douglass and talk about the Frederick Douglass Republican methodology, let me tell you more a little bit about myself. I am the founder and the president of the Frederick Douglass Republican movement. That's a new movement in our nation. We've been around about five years. I'm headquartered out of the Met. I live in Birmingham area, or actually Trustville. It's a new movement based on the life and power and values of Frederick Douglass. And when you hear what a Frederick Douglass Republican is, you're gonna realize you're already one. <laughs> you just didn't know it. I grew up in a Democrat household, a Democrat Christian household. When I was born, I knew I was born black. I thought I was born a Democrat. <laughs> Had you asked me back then why I was a Democrat, I would say because my mother, my, my mother, my father, or something along those lines. Two things changed my life. The word of God changed my life. The words of Frederick Douglass changed my political thinking. The word of God said to me in the scripture, if you read 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, it says, in the message translation, it says, examine yourself to make sure you are solid in the faith. Don't go along taking things for granted. You need first-hand evidence, not mere hearsay, that Jesus Christ is in you. If you fail the test, do something about it. So about 18, 19 years ago, I read that scripture so many times. One particular night I read it, and it hit me. And so I started examining myself. I started examining the way I was voting. And I was voting the opposite of my worship. I was voting the opposite of my worship. God diagnosed me and told me I was a political schizophrenic. <laughs> that I was crazy. I will worship one way and vote another. In other words, I don't believe in same-sex marriage. Now, if a person wants to live that way, that's fine. That's them. They have the liberty to do that. But I, would, I don't believe in it, but I was voting for a party or candidates blindly who advocated that, and I was voting for them. I was not an independent critical thinker. Let me say this whole thing about same-sex marriage. It, it, if somebody wants to live that lifestyle, that's fine. Here's the problem I have with it. Don't come back and change God's divine definition of marriage in order to remove the guilt. Amen. That's the problem I have with it. If somebody will live that lifestyle, you have God's free will to do that. But don't come change the definition to remove the guilt. That's the problem I have with it. So anyway, so the scripture changed my life. Douglas changed my thinking. You got to understand that I grew up in a Democrat household. Somebody one time sent me a quote from Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass said on one occasion, Douglass said, I'm a black dyed in the wool Republican. I know this is nonpartisan, but I got to give you a history class. Douglas said, I'm a black dyed in a wool Republican, meaning that if you put black dyed in wool, it's not going to come out. <laughs> and Douglas said, I never intend to belong to any party than a party of freedom and progress. Now, I grew up in a Democrat household. When I read that quote, I said, wait a minute, Frederick Douglass was a Tom? He was a Republican, he was a Tom? Hmm. And why did Frederick Douglass say freedom and progress Republican Party, and he did not say freedom and progress Democrat Party? So that started me on a quest several years ago. I read, of course, Frederick Douglass wrote three autobiographies. Everything I, I could get my hands on, the writings of Douglass, uh, I read it. Philip Fauna has a collection of Douglass's writings, about 1,000 pages, six sides font, selected writings of Douglass. A guy named Blasting Game has another writings of, of Douglass, six sides font, about 1,000 pages. Yale University has something called the collection called the Douglass Papers, about four or five volumes. Whew. 12 years of Douglass's writings were lost in a fire. That brother did a lot of writing. He wrote, in my opinion, he wrote more than Dr. King and the Apostle Paul put together. Because you no know, Apostle Paul 
is credit for writing the majority of the New Testament. But anyway, so I started this movement, and then there's a new movement. I am a conservative, but that's now how I describe myself politically. I'm a Frederick Douglass Republican. So when I say that I'm a Frederick Douglass Republican, that gives you a glimpse into my political psyche. That I believe in the four life empowering values of Frederick Douglass. Can I get this mic? Put this over here. I'm going to get tired of holding this thing. That I believe in the four life empowering values of Frederick Douglass. Number one, respect for the U.S. Constitution. Number two, respect for life. Number three, the belief in limited government. In other words, I like to keep more of the money that I make. And number four, the belief in personal responsibility. Um, so to become a Frederick Douglass Republican is not based on your color or your ethnicity. It's based on your belief in those four life empowering values. Before I go further, let me quickly dispel uh, three myths that exist regarding the Frederick Douglass Republican movement. A lot of folks just don't understand it because it's new, haven't heard it. Myth number one is this. The myth number one says that the Frederick Douglass Republican movement is a black membership organization. It is not. Again, to become a Frederick Douglass Republican is not based on your color. It's based on your embracing those four life and power and values of Douglass. Respect for the Constitution, respect for life, the belief in limited government, and belief in personal responsibility. Of about 60,000 people right now across the country have been trained in our engagement methodology. And they identify themselves as a Frederick Douglass Republican. Of that 60,000 people, 59% of them are white. Majority of them Tea Party activists. 59%. So this is not a black membership organization. This is not about, myth number two is this, the Frederick Douglass Republican methodology is about how to share conservatism with black folks. No, that's not what it is. It's how to share the life empowering values of the conservative philosophy with all Americans. This is not diversity training. This is liberty training Frederick Douglass style. That's what this is, okay? Myth number three is this. I need you to stop believing this lie. The lie is this, that because you are a white conservative, that you cannot engage somebody of a different ethnicity. In other words, you gotta have a black person go talk to a black person about conservatism, or a Hispanic person go talk to a Hispanic, that's a lie. Don't believe that lie. You have to be taught and trained in something that works. Let me ask you this question. Who established a diversity outreach program that is still having a major impact in the world today? Who established a diversity outreach program that is still having a major impact in the world today? It was Jehovah God. When he commissioned Paul to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Wait a minute. Paul was a Jew by ethnicity. He was commissioned to take the gospel to people of different races, the Gentiles. Paul was trained by Gamal. Conservatives. It's the conservative movement is predominantly made up of white Americans. And what are we trying to do? We're trying to share the life empowering message of the conservative philosophy to all Americans. You have to be trained in something that works. I know a lot of black conservatives who don't know how to engage black folks. I used to be one of them. I used to be one of them until God, God gave me this message. So with the Frederick Douglass Republican movement, what we advocate is this, number one, we are anti-establishment Republican Party. The Republican Party today does not resemble the party of Frederick Douglass at all, at all. So with this movement, with this movement, we're going to help the Republican Party to recapture its political distinction through agitation, political agitation, activism, and we're going to turn some furniture out. Some folks got to leave. I'm talking about the top. We have a leadership problem. Another thing we advocate is this, as a Frederick Douglass Republican, we are not a recruiter for the Republican Party. What I've learned over the years and what we advocate is this, we need people in both political parties with a Frederick Douglass perspective. We need truth tellers in both political parties. There's no perfect political party. And I think the RNC is wrong. The RNC is going out here trying to recruit blacks and minorities to the party. That's not what you want to do. You don't want to recruit somebody to the party. You want to inspire them to vote their values, and they'll figure out what party they want to be part of. You'll try to get a Baptist to become a Methodist. 
or Methodist become a Baptist? We need people in both parties with a Frederick Douglass perspective. That's what we advocate. Let me quickly move on and give you a little history about Frederick Douglass, this man here. I got to show you the picture, because some of you may not recall. Let me give you about a, give you about a three minute class on Frederick Douglass to refresh your memory. Frederick Douglass was born 1818 in the eastern shores area of Maryland. Frederick Douglass was born below poverty, below poverty. See, Dr. Ben Carson and Herman Cain, they were born into poverty. But when you're born into slavery, you don't own your own body, you're born below poverty. He never wore a pair of shoes until he was eight years old, never slept in the bed until age 10. Frederick Douglass was homeschooled, self-taught. He learned how to read and write while he was a slave on a plantation. He was a slave for the first 20 years of his life. The first 20 years of his life, Frederick Douglass was a slave. This is Black History Month, and I want to give you a history. You know, the father of Black History Month is a gentleman by the name of Carter G. Woodson. And Carter G. Woodson is the second black American to get a PhD from Harvard University. He first started Negro History Week, then it became so popular, it grew into Black History Month. And he picked February as Black History Month because the birthdays of two great Americans. Who, was the, who were those two? Lincoln, Abraham. Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Because Dr. King's birthday is in January. Who is Douglass' birthday? February 14th, Valentine's Day. Now here's what, when Douglass was born, he did not know the exact date of his birth. But when Douglass was born, he was immediately taken away from his mother. His mother lived and worked on a plantation that was 12 miles away where little Freddie was being brought up. In order to see her baby, she would walk 12 miles to see little Freddie but she had to walk 12 miles after she worked in the field when it was pitch dark. Walk 12 miles to see Freddie. And she had to walk 12 miles back to the plantation before the first call, the crack of, the crack of morning. And Douglas said, I can only recall meeting my mother on four occasions, but at the times I can remember being with my mother, she always referred to me as my little Valentine. And that's why Freddie Douglas picked February 14th as his birthday. So that's why Black History Month is the month of February, not because it's the shortest month of the year. It's because Carter G. Wilson picked that month because of the birthdays of two great Americans, Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass remained a slave to 1838. He escaped at the age of 20. He escaped from slavery at the age of 20. He escaped from slavery at the age of 20. What did he escape from? Slave master was providing him Health uh, care? Slave masks providing him health care, clothing, shelter, and food. Doug was getting that free stuff. But while on the system, he learned how to read and write. I guess you would say Douglas was a 47 percenter. But the story doesn't end there. When Douglas escaped from slavery, I want to fast forward a little bit. Um, he was his mentor by a guy named William Lloyd Garrison. But fast forward a little bit. Frederick Douglass was an advisor to five Republican presidents. Five presidents. Most folks don't get a chance to meet one president. Frederick Douglass, a man who never been to school in his life, was an advisor to five presidents. Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses S. Grant, James Garfield, Rutherford Hayes, and Benjamin Harrison. Frederick Douglass was a capitalist. He was a capitalist. He was a free market entrepreneur. He wrote three autobiographies. He didn't have a ghostwriter. That's pretty impressive because based on my reading, at that time in history, 90% of black Americans couldn't read and write, could not read or write. He wrote three books. He was a lecturer on the anti-slavery circuit, hired by William Lloyd Garrison. Frederick Douglass died 1895 at the age of 77. How much money in savings do you think Douglass had amassed at the time of his death? $300,000, you're right. $300,000 back then is more than $10 million a day. Here is a man who was a below zero percenter, 
end up being a 47 percent of while on the plantation, he died a one percenter. That's a story, that's a legacy worth elevating. See, we should not envy wealth creation, we should emulate it. Because Douglas gives us that, that's how you end generational poverty. If we are serious, ladies and gentlemen, about saving this country, if we are serious about defending liberty, if we are serious about preserving the blessings of liberty for our posterity, we must make Frederick Douglass an integral part of our message. Thank God that we have a literary legacy of the writings of Frederick Douglass to refute the lies of the left. I'm going to explain that in a minute. I'm going to make a statement here. Don't leave when I say this. I'm going to explain it in a minute. The political insight of Frederick Douglass is more important than the political insights of the Founding Fathers. K. Carl, that's heresy. <laughs> that's blasphemy, K. Carl. Let me say it again so you don't think I said something differently. The political insights of Frederick Douglass is more important than the political insights of the Founding Fathers. Here's why I'm saying this. The Founding Fathers gave us two magnificent documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Okay? When the, now, some of the founding fathers owned slaves, did they not? When the Constitution was ratified, that's not when the founding fathers freed their slaves. The slaves were freed after they died. So therefore, their view of liberty is somewhat tainted. Now, here comes Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass did not own any slaves. He was a slave, but in his writings and his speeches, he affirms both the Founding Fathers and the Constitution. And that's what the left don't like. Douglas said on one occasion, he wrote, Douglas said, the Constitution reads, we the people. It does not read, we the white people, Douglas said. If black folks are people, Douglas went later on explain, if black folks are people, they are to be the benefactors of this Constitution. Douglas closed that thing out by saying, the problem is not with the Constitution. The problem is in the application of the Constitution. The problem is not with the Bible. The problem is in the application of the Bible. Thank God we have a literary legacy of the writings of Frederick Douglass to refute the lies and propaganda of the left. You have to understand where we are as conservative and why this diversity challenge is such a challenge for the conservative movement. The word conservative, the word Tea Party, and the word Republican, Republican Party, those words have a negative connotation. They're synonymous with the word racist. If you call yourself a black conservative, Tea Party conservative, Christian conservative, Reagan conservative, based on who you're engaging, you'll do fine in here. But if you go out here and try to bring more diversity in, you might as well call yourself a black racist. Take that last word conservative and drop it off. You're a black racist, you're a Reagan racist, you're a Christian racist. We're losing the propaganda battle, and plus, there's a 600 pound elephant that's in the room that nobody wants to talk about. I'm gonna talk about it. In 1964, Linda B. Johnson signed the civil rights legislation into law, 1964. Of the 18 senators who voted against it, 17 were your racist, pro-segregation Democrats. Democrats. One Republican senator also voted against it. Who was that? Senator Barry Goldwater out of Arizona. Now, Barry Goldwater voted against it not because he was a racist. He voted against it based on constitutional grounds. What he did, he sought the opinion at that time of a Yale University professor, the guy by the name of Robert Bork. Robert Bork wrote a 75-page opinion that helped Goldwater make his decision. Goldwater disagreed with the civil rights legislation of 64 based on Title VII, Title II, and Title VII, one that dealt with accommodation and employment. He wasn't a racist. Matter of fact, indeed, Goldwater was an integrationist. When Goldwater inherited his father's retail business at the age of 37, Goldwater was the first, his company was the first company to hire black cashiers in Arizona. 
And Goldwater went around the city encouraging other business owners to do the same. He was not a racist. He, had, he disagreed with the civil rights legislation based on constitutional grounds. Connect the dots now. Connect the dots. As I, listen to connect the dots in your head as I, as I explain this. What was Barry Goldwater's nickname? Mr. Conservative. What's the title of the book that, that uh, Goldwater wrote? The Consciousness of a Conservative. Barry Goldwater, even though he had a constitutional reason why he, why he voted against it, he sided with the racist Democrats to add insult to injury at the 1964 Republican National Convention at the Cow Palace in San Francisco. Who did the Republican Party nominate as their candidate to run against LBJ in 64? Barry Goldwater. The party of Lincoln, the party of emancipation, nominated a guy who voted against the civil rights legislation and made him their presidential candidate. When that happened, black folks felt alienated. They were politically homeless. They were homeless. What you gonna do, go to the Democrats? They're worse. The day that Goldwater received that nomination, Dr. King issued a press release. Dr. King was the president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1964. But you gotta understand what happened in 63. What happened in 63 was the March on Washington. And so when Dr. King issued that press release in 64, Dr. King's name was a household name. I have a copy of the press release with me. I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you. I'm just gonna pull some things out. You can Google this, it's on the internet. So the day that the Republican Party nominated Goldwater as their presidential candidate, that same day Dr. King issued a press release. The title of the uh, press release, the title of the press release says, Statement from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on Republican nomination of Senator Barry Goldwater. Here's the first sentence. It is both unfortunate and disastrous that the Republican Party has nominated Senator Barry Goldwater as his candidate for presidency of the United States. It goes down to say, Dr. King is referring to Goldwater. While not himself a racist, Mr. Goldwater articulates a philosophy that gives aid and comfort to the racist. His candidacy and philosophy will serve as an umbrella under which extremists of all stripes will stand. In light of these facts, and because of my love for America, I have no alternative but to urge every Negro and every white person of goodwill to vote against Mr. Goldwater and withdraw support from the Republic from any Republican president, uh, any Republican candidate that does not politically disassociate himself with Goldwater. So what Dr. King said was this. Dr. King said he's not a racist, but, but Goldwater has some constitutional reasons. So what Dr. King said was, basically what he's saying, that Goldwater wanted to be so constitutionally right on the bill that he was morally wrong. Meaning that how in the world you gonna tell black folks in places like Mississippi that their future is in the hands of those politicians who were the racist Dixocrats, and we're not going to do anything from a federal level. When that happened, black folks in mass became Democrats. If you go back in 1960, Nixon won 60% of the black vote. 60, no, I did not take it back. Nixon won 32% of the black vote. That's 1960. In 1964, Goldwater got 6% of the black vote, and it's been like that ever since. Well, I think Reagan got, got maybe, Romney got, 10, Romney got seven, I think Reagan got maybe 10, Nixon got 15 later on, 12 or 15. But that's where we are. That's why the word conservative and the word Republican, it has become culturally ingrained in the black community to mean racist. I was like, I was not even nine, 10 years old at that time. The first time I heard Goldwater's name, I heard the word conservative and racist in the same sentence. So what's happening, we're being, de well, here's what's ironic about this whole thing. 
The party that gave us slavery, the Democrat Party. The party that gave us the KKK, the Democrat Party. The party that, start, that uh, did not pass any anti-lynching laws when white and, white and black Republicans were being lynched, the Democrat Party. The party that gave us Jim Crow, the Democrat Party. The, part, the people who bombed 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, the city where I'm from, were the Democrats. What happened, when that happened in 64, the Democrat Party took control of the narrative because we gave it up. Republican Party, conservatives gave it up. And the Democrats had con has had control of the narrative because overnight, overnight they now appear to be innocent. Overnight. You follow me? They don't deserve the narrative. So in order to keep the narrative, what's going on is this. In order to keep the narrative, control the narrative, the Democrat leadership, not the rank and file, they don't know what's going on. I didn't know what's going on, my parents didn't know. It, the Democrat leadership, they deceive, they distort, they are accused, and they rewrite history. And I can prove all four points. Let's start from the bottom about rewriting history. Thank God we have a literary legacy of the writers of Douglas who defeat the lies and propaganda of the left. Your homework assignment is this. If you go to the Democrat Party's website right now, it's democrats.org. On their home page, there's an about. And when you click about, the sublink says our history. The first sentence, the first paragraph. Here's the first uh, set of words in that first paragraph on that page on our history. And I quote, for more than 200 years, we have led the fight for civil rights. <laughs> That's on the Democrat Party's website. Right now, I've been telling this to my black friends and uh, white liberals and black liberals for the past year and a half. It's been up for a year and a half. You know how many of them have had the moral courage to go and tell the leadership to take it down? Not a one. We need truth tellers in both parties. That's why we got Douglas, because Douglas was alive 200 years ago. Douglas wrote an, uh, an editorial. He called, the, he called it the Slavery Party. Douglas said, and I quote, Douglas said, the best representation of slavery in politics is the Democrat Party. Why? Because they were anti-black. They supported slavery. When you go to their website, somebody is lying. Either it's Douglas or them. So when you deceive, when you distort, when you accuse, and you rewrite history, that's a demonic technique to control. I'm not afraid to say what I'm saying. I can back it up. Now, how do they accuse? They always want to accuse conservatives or Republicans to be racist. That's called projection. I got to call you a racist first so you don't see that I'm the real racist. <laughs> Revelations 12 and 10, Satan sits at the throne all day long, all night long. He is the accuser of the brethren. Here is Satan, Mr. Wrongdoer, sitting at God's throne accusing us. It's a technique. It's not the rank and file, it's the leadership from the White House down to the State House. They know what's going on. And they've been lying to my people and all of us all these years because when you don't know the truth, you can't recognize a lie. They deceive, they distort, they accuse, and they rewrite history. Thank God we have this literary legacy of Douglas to refute the lies and propaganda left. So how do we get out of this? If we're losing this propaganda battle, a message falls on deaf ears. How do we gotta get out of this mess? How do we fix the, the matter of fact, when Gold, before Goldwater passed away, he admitted he made a mistake of how he voted and he regretted how he voted. How do we fix this thing? The only way we can fix it is through Frederick Douglass. He's the only way. The values that you embrace, Frederick Douglass not only wrote about it, he lived it. Here's what's, what we have to do. We have to learn how to engage. We got to be able to talk to our friends, talk to our family members, talk to our fellow citizens about our conservative values without the fear of being called a racist, without the fear of being called a sellout. And at the same time, inspire that person to join the ranks of our movement because this is a center right nation. And what we have to do, we got to be able to be, we got to win the propaganda battle. You cannot call a Frederick Douglass Republican a racist or a sellout.
I believe what Douglas believed in. What has to happen, we have to carefully study and show ourselves approved. Let me quickly uh, share this with you. I'll forget to talk about it later. I'm not here, I didn't come here to hawk a book. I'm, a, I'm here to show you and share with you something that works. I wrote a book entitled Frederick Douglass Republicans, The Movement to Reignite America's Passion for Liberty. Not the movement to reignite black folks' passion for liberty or Asians' passion for liberty. The movement to reignite America's passion for liberty. Most folks don't understand communism and socialism, so you gotta give them a different metaphor. And that metaphor is slavery. Well, met the, and when you talk about slavery, you gotta bring in Douglas, because slavery was not a metaphor for him. It was real. The book is an action, it is a conservative action handbook. This is not a political, this is not a dissertation on the political views of Douglas. It is a conservative action handbook. It's a book that gives you the, gives you the information so you can engage. My brother and I went to the painstaking effort of reading all the things we get our hands on on Douglas. And for those four life empowering values, we give you five quotes. What did Douglas say about respect for the Constitution? What did Douglas say about the respect for life? Because you know, the abortion issue was not the issue at that time. It was slavery and women's suffrage. But Douglas had a perspective on life. Uh, by the way, Douglas was an ordained minister. He was an AME Zion preacher. What, what are the five, the five quotes from Douglas on personal responsibility in limited government? So the book gives you the information you need so you can engage. Damn. Then I sat down and wrote a companion guide to the book to hone your skill when it comes to engaging. Here's what uh, the Lord did. He sat me down, he had me study the ministry of Jesus Christ. When you study Christ's ministry, do you recall sometimes how the scribes and the Pharisees would sometimes try to trap him? to get him to say something damaging so hopefully they could discredit him and his message fall on deaf ears. That's what the left do to us as conservatives. They're hoping that we say something damaging so they can call us a racist, so they can call us a sellout, so they can discredit us and hopefully our message fall on deaf ears. But the scribes and Pharisees did not realize, number one, that the Christ was a subject matter expert. They didn't know that. And they did not realize he had the gift of taking their challenges and he could take that challenge, that challenge and turn around and make it a teachable moment and inspire many of them to join the ranks of the movement. That's what we must do. So in this companion guide, I identified the 12 most asked challenges that we face as conservatives and how you take that challenge and you turn around and you make it a teachable moment. Let me give you an example. Let's say you are here, you want to engage. You know this diversity inclusion thing is a big thing. You want to engage, so you are here engaging. And they ask you if you are conservative. What would you have said? What would you say? Before you met me, you say yes, you just lost. Once you say conservative Republican, the wall goes up. The wall is up. I don't care what facts, figures, and truth you provide after that, the wall is up. You follow me? I know. I, that used to be me. See, I wasn't converted to conservatism. I've always been one, I just didn't know it. Growing up, in the Huntsville, Alabama, the liberal left-wing progressive philosophy was always in my ear. That's all I heard. I never got the kind of argument until I became an adult. Because concerns weren't in my ear. If they were, they didn't know how to talk to me. They always try to be uh, talking down to me, condescending, all that kind of mess. So I rejected for a long time. But anyway, so what we must do, we gotta learn how to take the challenges of the left and turn it around. Here is here example. K. Carr, are you a conservative? I'm a Frederick Douglass Republican. And as a Frederick Douglass Republican, I believe in the four life and power and values of Frederick Douglass. Respect for the U.S. Constitution, respect for life. I believe in limited government, and I believe in personal responsibility. And sometimes the Christ will answer their challenge with a question. And you gotta do the same thing. Do you share these values of Douglass? Most folks gonna say yes. <laughs> you say, guess what? <laughs> That makes you a conservative, better still, makes you a Frederick Douglass Republican, and that's the hook. When you study the ministry of Christ, he never, he never responded to a challenge from the Pharisees and scribes by saying yes or no. Never did. He said, it is written, I tell you the truth, which means that Christ knew his history. We don't know our history like that, so we got to carefully study to show ourselves approved. You follow me? Here's another one. This is, I know this is nonpartisan, but it's, it's going to come up. Somebody asks you if you're a Republican, and you say yes, 
you just lost. The Royal Republican, Royal Republican has a negative connotation. K. Carl, are you Republican? I'm a Frederick Douglass Republican. That's not the same thing as Republican. The Republican Party today does not resemble the party of Frederick Douglass. And what we're going to do with this party, we're going to have the Republican Party recapture its political distinction and get it back to where it was in the time of Douglass. When it, when it was a defender of the Constitution, and it made the plight of the poor a legislative priority, not in terms of entitlements for a lifetime, but to elevate the poor to become entrepreneurs and employees. When the least of these are helped and elevated, everybody else will be elevated. So the, it's, it's like that. Let me quick, quickly share a couple, uh, three testimonies with you. I, 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 there's thousands of them out there. The first one is this. You heard of Senator Edward Guillory. He's a Democrat, at that time a Democrat politician out of Louisiana that flipped and became a Republican. Y'all heard about him. It went viral. Here's what you don't know. The Louisiana GOP had been trying to get Guillory to flip for the past three years because as a Democrat, he has a very conservative voting record. So they've been talking to him for the past three years, trying to get him to change parties. He wouldn't do it. I was asked to speak at an event and part of my duty was to give out their first Frederick Douglass Award, and the award recipient was Senator Guillory. I'm not gonna give out an award until I talk to somebody, talk to him. So I talked to him on the phone. This is two months before we made the change, before he made the switch. And in that conversation, he said, you know, okay, Carl, I'm, I'm thinking about using, I'm thinking about changing parties here soon, and, but I'm concerned because if I do change parties and come out saying I'm Republican, I'm gonna lose my constituency because my district is, is a minority majority district. I said, what you gonna do? He said, I don't know. I said, why have you done it? I said, I, I know, that. I said, I think I'd be committing political suicide. You're exactly right, I told him. So at that time, I started mentoring him and coaching him on the Frederick Douglass uh, message. So when he came out with the videos, you saw that he embraced Douglass. Every time he talks, he talks about Douglass. Douglass gives you cover, it gives you cover. The, um, because in order to attack me or to attack Guillory, you gotta attack Douglas first. I just believe everything Douglas believes in. So when someone attacks, Gil uh, attacks Douglas, that's when you find out who the true racists are and the true sellouts are. And we have Douglas's writings to, to back us up. The uh, other testimony is this. Sharon Angle, you heard of Sharon Angle out of Nevada, who ran against uh, Senator Harry Reid for the Senate seat uh, last, uh, well, pre previous elections, you know what I'm talking about. I met Sharon Angle last summer, shared the message with her and kind of did her, went through some training with her. She and I were scheduled to meet in Atlanta in November at an event to speak. The testimony is this, when Sharon was getting ready to leave Reno, she was at the Reno airport getting ready to fly to Atlanta. Three black women walked up to her and they recognized her. They said, uh, where are your travels taking you this time? And Sharon said, well, she said, I'm going to try this Frederick Douglass thing out. So she said, I'm going to Atlanta to meet with a Frederick Douglass Republican friend of mine. And so the three black women said, Frederick Douglass, a Republican? And Sharon said, yes, Frederick Douglass was a Republican and he believed in, those, he believed in four life empowering values. When she said that, the women said to her, can you come to our church and share this message? See, this is, how we, this is how you change hearts and mind. In order to change hearts and mind, you must have a message that's non-confrontational and non-condescending. You have to deliver it in love. If not, the wall's gonna go up. Frederick Douglass is the bridge over the abyss of racism and class warfare that's been created by the left. He's the bridge. There is no other you can, there's no one else you can think of that brings to the table what Frederick Douglass brings. A slave who wrote a lot. <laughs> he wrote a lot about the Constitution. He wrote that, he, he, Douglass wrote about welfare mentality. Douglass said on one occasion while he was a slave, the slave master walked up to him and said, Freddie, make no plans for the future. I'll take care of you. Douglass said right then, I started putting my plan together for escape. Because <laughs> it, it had the opposite effect. The, the, thank God for giving us Frederick Douglass for this time in history. 
one of the most powerful things that Douglas brings to the table is this. I don't care what or which victim category the left put people in, they cannot out-victimize Frederick Douglass. Can't out-victimize him. I travel the country, I'm also a motivational speaker, I talk to urban youth about success. I said, you're here with poor health care, Douglas had no health care. You here with opportunity to go to education, it was against law for, to, to teach a black how to read and write. With all those adversities in front of him, Douglas excelled. And what I shared with him that success is not a secret, success is a system. And I shared with them Douglas' system for success. There's like six things Douglas did, because you know, Douglas' slave master was, rumor was, Douglas' slave master was his father. So Douglas didn't have nobody mentoring him. What I learned that Douglas became an avid reader, so words on paper became his mentor. When Douglas was on the plantation, he had three books. He had a dictionary, the Bible, and a book you can get on Amazon. It's called The Columbian Orator. The Columbian Orator was a book used by the more affluent families in the 1800s. It's a book that teaches you how to become an orator. And it has some of the writings and speeches of some of the best thinkers on natural law and liberty. George Washington, Cicero, Benjamin Franklin, for example, is in this book. That's what shaped Douglas' worldview as a 12-year-old boy when he bought that copy of the book for 50 cents. You have to understand, and I'm going to say this, if you're waiting for the RNC cavalry to come to say that they, the RNC cavalry ain't coming, the, the, the Republican Party can't fix itself. It ain't coming. The way that what we're doing to get things straight, we got to agitate and become growth from the bottom up. That's how this is going to change. The, one, one thing the Republican Party is doing, they, are, they hired a lot of people across the United States, and, they, and they're supposed to be doing diversity outreach. And it's not working. And I know it's not working. I, I'll tell you why in a minute. So they're hiring these people to do diversity outreach, and they're telling them, create this database and start going to these affinity, these ethnic affinity groups meetings. Start going to the Urban League meetings and the NWCP meetings and just show up. What's happening, they're going, but they're getting pushed back. They're being brutalized. They're being humiliated. They don't know what to say. They don't know how to respond. So they're calling my organization, asking us to help them with messaging. I said, I don't have time for you. If you want to know, get the book. Because what they want to do, instead of coming from the top of the RNC down to them, they're reaching out for help. Because RNC is not teaching them anything about messaging. Because RNC don't know. Why? Because they don't use Douglas. They're using something called the Chris Christie strategy. <laughs> the Chris Christie strategy is this. Chris Christie won his re-election, and he got 10% of the black vote. And I think that the reason why he got 10% of the black vote because Chris Christie had the courage to go out to these different ethnic groups and start uh, speaking. These Latino groups and the black groups started speaking. And he would go there to these groups and Spanish groups speaking Spanish. He would go to the Urban League group and all this kind of stuff. That's not why he got 10% of the black vote. You know why he got 10% of the black vote? Because, because during Superstorm Sandy, he had photo ops with Obama. That image of him walking around with Obama, that's what put him in the spotlight. Because I remember when that happened, I do go to the barbershop and get my beard trimmed. So in the barbershop, that's what they're talking about. RNC, they don't, they don't know what they're doing. I'm not mad with them, even though they stubbed me three times. I'm not angry with them. I'm puzzled by them. Here is a methodology that flipped Guillory. Here's a methodology of the Fred Republican that less than two weeks later flipped a second Louisiana politician, a guy named Ralph Washington, to become a Republican. Here's a methodology when people come to our training, they now can go home and talk to their mother, their father, their sister, their brothers, and flip them. Not literally, but, but I'm saying, <laughs> they, they're getting them to vote their values. Not to get them to become a Republican. Get them to vote their values. And, they don't, and the RC don't want to hear about it. So I told the chairman, I told the leadership, I said, you better wake up because you're going to be on the outside looking in. Doug is the answer to save this nation. Doug is the answer to put both political parties in check. We need people in both parties who have the moral courage to be truth tellers. I told my friends, I said, you not, I said now you know this. I pointed to you on the website, and you're not going to do anything. 
When you, when you know this lie has been told to your people, then you're not going to do a thing about it. You're a traitor to your race. Tell them to take that lie down and tell the truth about their history. They hadn't done it yet. And based on my statistics, what I'm keeping up with, I don't, I don't see it happening. We, gotta be, we need truth tellers in both parties. Let me go through my mental notes right quick, make sure I covered everything. The answer to get out of this message, Fred Douglas, is my message to you. Everyone here must become a Fred Douglas Liberty Messenger or a Fred Douglas Republican. See, the Fred Douglas Liberty Message is a nonpartisan expression. Fred Douglas Republican is what God, what God has given me. Don't go around and call yourself a Fred Douglas Libertarian. That's not what this is. <laughs> or a Fred Douglas Patriot. There's a reason why God gave me Fred Douglas Republican. You know why? That's an oxymoron. Douglas and I come of Liberty Republican because Republicans shot themselves in the foot in 64 and because of not winning the propaganda battle, an icon of racism. So when you say Fred is Republican, most folks don't know what you're talking about. But since you're going to carefully study to show yourself approved, and you're going to get K. Carl's book, you're going to know how to engage and know how to expound. And I'll share this with you. One more thing. At the 1964 uh, Republican National Convention at the Cow Palace in San Francisco, Jackie Robinson was at the floor of that convention. You ought to read and study how black Republican delegates were treated at that convention. Because they were not Goldwater delegates, they were Rockefeller delegates. They were spat on, they were called, called outside their name. The RNC security would let them to the floor. One guy was suit was set on fire with him in the suit. 1964, Jackie Robinson was on the floor of the convention at the time. He was interviewed. Jackie Robinson said, now I see what it's like to be a Jew in Hitler's Germany. And at that time, Jackie Robinson became a Democrat. There's no perfect political party. We need people in both political parties with a Frederick Douglass perspective. And don't mind having the moral courage to be truth tellers. That's how we're going to fix this nation. That's how we're going to fix it. Douglas is the answer, though. See, Douglas trumps the race card. Douglas defeats all the propaganda of the left. So when all that propaganda stuff comes off the table, you got the issues now. You can't, you can't distort. You get to the issues. What I've learned over the past five years is this. When I say that I'm afraid of Doug's Republican and I know how to engage it is a powerful tool. It, it works. My parents changed how they vote. My parents call themselves not a conservative, they call themselves afraid of Doug's Republican. All three of my brothers have. Thanksgiving to my family is different now. <laughs> when I was a black conservative, when I was a black conservative, see, what I can tell you was this. When God gave me this awareness, I went through three days of depression. I didn't come out of the house for three days. What happened was, when I read 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, depression came in because I didn't realize that through my vote, I was spitting in my God's face, and I wouldn't do that on purpose. Depression came in. I went further down in my depression because all the things I believed to be true, I found out was a lie. When you spend all your life defending, I was in NAACP. When you spend all your life defending a party that told you lies, you don't know it's a lie, you realize it's a lie, that's depression time. I thought George Wallace was a Republican. <laughs> I thought Bull Connor was a Republican. I thought the people who bombed 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama were Republicans. They were Democrats. When that truth came to me, depression took me down. I couldn't believe that all my life I've been fooled like that. The last thing that took me down in my depression was this. When God gave me this conservative tone, this conservative understanding, I knew by me accepting it that I was going to isolate myself from my family members and isolate myself from the black community as a whole. Some folks are just not there yet. I knew that going to family reunions, they know about my political leanings is going to be tough for me. It was tough. I knew that during Thanksgiving time, I had to go sit at the tiny table. <laughs> but things are different now. I'm a Frederick Douglass Republican. Um, MSNBC is trying to slam this whole thing. They said that this, th this is the magical phrase. They got it wrong. There's nothing magical about this. This is, the, this is a God-given divine inspirations phrase. They they're think they're fighting me. They're not fighting me. On uh, John Stewart's show, he was mocking me because I referred to myself as Frederick Douglass Republican, and he had this black guy on the set. 
And they're saying is this, why do you have to go back 150 years to show you're not a racist or that you're not a sellout? I wasn't on the show. They didn't invite me. But had I been on the show, here's what I would have said. Christians, those who practice the Christian faith, those who practice the Jewish faith or Islam, they go back more than 2,000 years to read the writings of their prophets to get spiritual inspiration. Why can't I go back 150 years to read the writings of Douglas against the political inspiration? <laughs> so what I learned, it's not about the years, it's about Douglas. They don't want me to read about Douglas. Because thank God, Douglas, we got the truth now to refute the lies and propaganda of the left. I do have some books here for every one of you. Uh, the books, they come as a set. The, bo the books are free. The autograph inside the book is $20. <laughs> I'm a capitalist. I'm a capitalist. What are your questions? What are your questions? What are your questions? Not your comments, because I want to respect people's time. What are your questions? Make sense to you? Yes. This is something you can do, but you got to learn how to engage. You got to learn how to talk to your friends, how to talk to your family members your fellow citizens, and understand how the word conservative has been demonized, at how we're losing the propaganda battle, but also how we gave up the narrative. Because overnight, overnight, the Democrat Party had control of the narrative. The party that gave us all this racism, they, now they appear to be innocent. No. Uh-uh. Yes? You talk to Frederick Douglass to old people, they don't know who he is. <laughs> because they don't teach Douglas. They don't teach the substance of Douglas. But that's okay, because remember what I said earlier. We have to carefully study to show ourselves approved. So if you know something about Douglas that I don't know, you're driving the narrative in the conversation. You're framing the debate. You're the person now in the conversation who is influencing me. Here's what I learned. When someone that's not a black American says, I'm a Frederick Douglass Republican, and you're sincere about this, you study, so you study and show yourself approved. What I'm saying to you is this, when a white person says I'm a Frederick Douglass Republican, it's more powerful when you say it than when I say it. Here's why I say this. That's my ethnicity. People expect me to say that. But through the media, all we hear that white conservatives are racist. They have no redemptive bone in their body. They'll always be racist. And you got one saying, I'm a Frederick Douglass Republican, and I hold this man in high esteem. You just changed some things in people's mind. But you have to be, you can't be an empty suit now. You have to carefully study, show yourself approved. Because here's what the left going to do. The left going to come out, what's the third thing? They're going to attack. And they're going to say, oh, you're just using Douglass to get the black vote. Here's what you have to tell them. You don't know how a God in my life touches me every day that inspires me with truth. So don't let them write your testimony. That's what they want to do. They want to separate you from truth so they can attack you. Never, ever let anybody call you a Republican alone or conservative alone or Tea Party alone. It's over with. Those are attack words. It's over with in terms of engaging. And your message will never come across. You'll never change anybody's heart and mind. This is a spiritual battle. I think I won the lottery. Out of 300 some million people in this country, God gave me this message. And I'm spending my life delivering this message. This is not for me. This is for my six grandchildren. I go out and speak. Obama does not come out of my name or my mouth. Why? Well, it's not about him. It's about our children and our grandchildren and what they're doing to our children and our grandchildren. That's what it's all about. I'll share this with you. It's in the companion guide. I went to, um, I'm always invited to black churches to speak because what we do, we share the message with the pastor. If the pastor's inspired by it, great. If he's not, that's great too. Because See, my goal that God has given me, I'm not here to convert anybody. My goal is to make you aware, because once you're aware, you're accountable. I'm out of it. <laughs> my brother and I was asked to speak to the black church. We shared the book with a pastor, a friend of his. My brother's a pastor too. He was so impressed with the message, he said, come share this message with my congregation. We did that. Before I got a chance to speak, a middle-aged black lady walked up to me, because they promoted this conservative K. Carl to come to speak. So it kind of set me up a little bit. <laughs> so she walks up to me and she said, 
I, this isn't before, this isn't church now, before I got a chance to speak. She said, I am an Obama lover. You and I will never agree. My response was that you're exactly right because I'm a God lover. She said, I'm a God lover. I said, wait a minute, ma'am, that's not what you said. He didn't, God didn't come out of your mouth. He wasn't on your mind. You said exactly what you meant. I said, ma'am, you go to Bible study to, keep, to critique God's word. You go to church and listen to the sermon, and you go home, I hope you critique the pastor, what he's saying. You got your own homeschool Bible study program to critique his word. Now, the God couldn't sin, but you're going to critique his word. Obama is like all of us. He has a sinful nature. You don't even question his policy. I was on a liberal talk show. I don't do those mo anymore because I'm not invited. <laughs> um, and they, they asked me, they kept asking me, they tried to get me to bash Obama. It's not about Obama. Because after him, there'd be somebody else. It's about my children and my grandchildren. He said, well, here's a problem that conservatives and Republicans had. They don't know how to critique Obama. Because you got to understand now, the left, they're the master of propaganda. When you do critique him, they're going to call you a racist or Uncle Tom, or you don't, support the, you don't support the first black president. So you have to critique him through the eyes of Frederick Douglass. When you critique him through the eyes and perspective of Frederick Douglass, oh, somebody is a shield of respect, and somebody is not. That's what helped me. Now, I understand the historical significance of President Obama being the first person of color to occupy the highest office in the land. I respect that. I teach that to my grandchildren. But what I learned by studying Douglas, there was another major historical event, too, involving the president, when Lincoln became the first Republican president. That was a major historical event. Douglas campaigned for Lincoln. But Douglas did not stay stuck in the historical celebration. He started looking at Lincoln and looking for uh, constitutional critique. He started looking for political substance. For a lot of people are doing Obama, they're staying stuck in historical celebration and don't look for political substance. How is this policy affecting the poor? The vicious to the poor. The late 2009, the Obama administration cut the historical black colleges by $72 million. Cut it. That the presence of the historical black colleges had to go out and get lobbyists, put pressure on the administration, and the administration gave them $82 million. That was the second thing they did. The first thing that you ever heard of the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program? The DC Opportunity Scholarship Program was started by Bush to give inner city kids in Washington, DC, a chance to attend some of the private and better performing schools based on government money. Obama came in, cut the program. Cut it. So I'm supposed to sit back and give them a pass? Can you treat the poor like that? We need truth tellers. So when you, when, you, when you tell these, cut the program, the program ends, now these kids got to go back to the poor performing schools. The way you get out of slavery, the way you get out of poverty student education, he just cut off an escape route. If people want to give him a pass, you can't do that. You have to critique him. Critique is a form of love. You have to critique him so he can grow and develop as a leader. The question is, he got to accept the criticism. Lincoln said some racist things during his first inaugural address. But Douglas did not give up on Lincoln. Douglas critiqued Lincoln, and Lincoln grew and developed as a leader. When someone says, when, when the survey comes out, 60% of the people say they don't want health care reform in the fashion they was trying to socialize medicine, and you have a president that says, I'm not going to give up, we got a problem. I'm not going to give up pushing this agenda. That means I don't care how much misery and how much poverty I'm going to cause, I'm going to push this agenda. That's a problem. That's why we got, that's why we got afraid of Douglas. The truth of lies and defeat the propaganda of the left. And Douglas is the answer. There's nobody you can think of. Before there was Reagan, there was Douglas. Before there was a Republican Party, there was Douglas. And because of a Douglas, there was a Cecil Lincoln. This man cannot be left out of the narrative. Why? It trumps the race card if he's a class warfare tax. What's, the, what's, what's, the, what's another challenge? The conservatives don't care about the poor? Or Republicans don't care about the poor? K. Carl, um, conservatives and Republicans don't care about the poor. I never said I was conservative. I'm a Frederick Douglass Republican. And nobody did more for the poor than Frederick Douglass. Nobody. Nobody talked to Lincoln and four million blacks were technically free from slavery. While as a boy on a plantation, 
A teenage boy Douglas started a tutorial program to teach other blacks how to read and write for them for liberty. Thank God we have a literary legacy of the writings of Frederick Douglass to refute the lies and the propaganda of the left. We must elevate this legacy. I'm not putting Douglass on a pedestal, but I'm elevating the values that he embraced, the same thing we believe in. He's key. It won't work without him. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm sorry. This might, this might be, I don't know where it necessarily fits, but this is what I feel like it sounds like a good direction. But I feel like maybe the United States is getting right for a really good third party versus let's try to correct a Republican party sure. that's corrupt and the Democratic party is corrupt. And right now everybody hates both systems to some degree. Yeah. Why don't you look at it as maybe a third party? I'm not there yet. Because we never, we, we never tried Douglas, And if we have a third party, you still got the same propaganda battles. They still gonna call you, you're not gonna stop calling yourself conservatives. They still gonna call you, you still gotta fight that propaganda battle. So if you start a third party and you don't have Douglas, you ain't gonna, it ain't gonna work. You have Tea Party. What? You have Tea Party up there. What about it? The Tea, the tea Party has already lost its ability to defeat the, defeat the propaganda of the left. So, so, and they demonize the Tea Party. The left has done that. You, you want to see somebody start demonizing Frederick Douglass Republicans? You're going to find who the true racists and sellouts are. Well, so when you think of this Frederick Douglass Republican movement, basically, when you think about it, we're the offensive strategy to the Tea Party movement. The things you believe in, I believe in. But I, 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 I refer to Frederick Douglass to help me present my case. Everything. Financial stewardship, limited government. Douglas wrote about these things extensively. The Constitution. Yeah. So the key thing is, when you, if you're going to have a diversity outreach program or diversity inclusion program, and Douglas is not the integral part of your message, you don't have a program because you're going to be a victim of the race card, which Douglas defeats. Class warfare attacks, which Douglas defeats. Yes, ma'am. Um, I learned about a group in the past week about uh, from listening on talk radio. There was a young guy that was on the Mon um, Monica Crowley show, and he was representing a group called Turning Point USA. And what this group is, it's a group of young people who are starting conservative groups at the high school and college level. They're all across the U.S. Yeah. They need to hear the message you're talking about. I met with the founder of the organization. Really? Yeah. So we got, we got to do some follow-up. I've been talking with some down in Georgia yeah. who are volunteering to come and talk to us. We have to take this Frederick Douglass. See, this is not diversity training. That's not what this is. This is liberty training Frederick Douglass style. And we have to take this message to everywhere the socialist left have their poison and challenge it with truth, challenge it with Douglass. Yes, sir. <laughs> Where's the Tea Party going wrong? I, you know, we started off as a, as a group of people who were uh, concerned about sure. economics and this sort of thing. And we've had a certain level of uh, success, especially in two, 2010. And uh, we bear a lot of influence even in this community to get things done. Yes. Uh, so where are we going wrong and how can we incorporate what you're saying tonight into what we're already doing so we can be more successful? Yeah. Don't forget what I said earlier. In order to keep control of the narrative, the left will deceive, distort, accuse, and they rewrite history. So they have to accuse you of being a racist. They must keep that up, because they don't stand for truth. They must be on the attack. So it's not where you have gone wrong, it's that you have not won the propaganda battle. And so you're being demonized. You gonna tell me there's no racist in the Democrat Party? Come on. The biggest racist I've ever witnessed in my life, I'm 56 years old, are blacks and how blacks treat each other. You can't get bigger racist than what I've experienced and, and witnessed in my life. I'm a graduate of a historical black college. And when I was on campus, a certain sorority had something called the brown paper bag test, meaning that if you're a young lady and your skin tone was darker than a brown paper bag that you get from Kroger's, you couldn't join that sorority. You can't get more racist than that. So racism has no political face. Racism has no political face. So what I learned by studying Douglas is this. Racism is here. 
It ain't going to go nowhere. It's been around since Christ. The question is this. What are you doing to make a difference? You know it's there. How are you interacting? How are you impacting to make a difference? What God is doing with me is this. You ever heard of Foresight, Georgia? Foresight, Georgia is where the KKK is supposed to be thriving. Matter of fact, Open Winfrey did a show from Foresight, Georgia. God sent me to places that some folks won't dare to go. Foresight, Georgia. Invited, I, and I couldn't make it, so I sent my brother. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, literally, I, really, I really couldn't make it. <laughs> but you, you, you can YouTube Foresight County Tea Party, Foresight County GOP, and Carney Sif, K-R-N-I-E. So he went and spoke in my behalf. And we shared this message of Douglas with them, teaching them how to engage in Forsyth County, Georgia. Three months after we left, they decided, you know what, we're going to put the practice what's in K. Carl's book. In three months, they had inspired six blacks in Forsyth, Georgia to join the GOP. In Forsyth County, Georgia. <laughs> Why? When they came out the closet, they can put on Douglas. And you're not going to go through the emulation when you get home. Because you're saying you support what Douglas believed in. Douglas wasn't a Tom. He wasn't a racist. He was a victim of racism. He wasn't a Tom. He escaped from slavery. Have others escaped from slavery. See, what the left, left cherry picks Douglas. They won't tell you Douglas was a one percenter. They won't say he has social concerns. He has social concerns, but he has some entrepreneurial spirit. They don't tell you the whole story. Why do you think they have, none, have not done a movie on Douglas? Because Douglas refused the lies and propaganda of the socialist, communist, and left. This is about liberty, ladies and gentlemen. That's what makes this country so great. It was a big experiment that our God-given rights come from God, not from the president, not from some king. It comes from our God. And so when the government takes our rights away, we take away our God-given rights away. I'm going to share this with you. Douglas said on one occasion, Douglas said, the cruelty of slavery was not the hard work. Douglas said, my gosh, I'm working harder as a free man. He said, the cruelty of slavery was that I did not benefit from the, uh, benefit from the fruits of my labor. Douglas said one occasion, Douglas said, slavery is based on the distorted philosophy of taking the fruits of one man's labor and giving it to another so he can remain, remain idle. That sounds like risk, wealth, and distribution to me. I was challenged on that by a PhD guy, diversity affairs kind of guy. He said, no, that's wealth creation because the slave master took that wealth and got rich. I said, no, that's not wealth creation. Wealth creation is that if you have a product or a business and I freely engage in commerce and I give you my money for your product or business, you become rich, that's wealth creation. But if you take my money without my consent and you pass it around, that's wealth distribution. The key word is consent. Douglas wrote about that. <laughs> Douglas. So I'm here to tell you, it's Douglas, it's Douglas, it's Douglas, it's Douglas. Douglas helped Lincoln save a nation. Lincoln said at one time because of the Civil War, the United States is a house divided. He brought Douglas in as, as being an advisor to him. It would behoove us to read the writings of Douglas to figure out how we can save this nation again. Because what the left is doing, they're doing it based on propaganda, not by truth. They demonize the founding fathers. They demonize the Constitution, all which Douglas wrote about. You heard of the three-fifth clause? And I'm going to shut up. The three-fifth clause, I went to historical black college. I was taught that the founding fathers gave us slavery in the Constitution because of the three-fifth clause saying that blacks are three-fifths of, of human beings. I was taught that. And they still teach this, by the way. They still teach this. Thank God we got the writings of Douglas. If you the lies of propaganda of the left. 1861, 1860, Douglas in, it was in uh, Glasgow, Scotland. Douglas is the one that gives clarity to the three-fifth clause. Douglas said, wait a minute. The three-fifth clause has nothing to do to say blacks are three-fifths of a human being. Douglas, and it's in the book, by the way, the, the, the quote, the, uh, that, that speech from Douglas, and I have it in the book, because Douglas wrote all his speeches down. Douglas said the three-fifth clause was a compromise used by the northern free states, the northern free states above the southern slave states. See, the southern slave states want to count every black person in, in slavery as one person, one vote. The northern free states said, no, if you free them, we'll let you count them as one person, one vote. But since you can't free them, and we like to get this Constitution ratified, 
we'll let you count the slave population as three-fifths of a vote. Douglas wrote about that. They didn't teach me that, they didn't teach me that in college. I got a full dose of the, uh, W.B. Du Bois. Go figure. Douglas is about liberty. So if we are serious about defending liberty, defending the Constitution, preserving the blessings of liberty for our families, and get this nation back on track, we can't do it without Douglas. Thank God we have Douglas in his writings. That's my message to you. And this is the last question here, because. Yeah, we're, we're working on a screenplay as we speak. Working on a screenplay as we speak. Not a documentary, a Frederick Douglass movie. A movie. So people will be entertained, but at the same time being educated. Make sense to you? Make sense to you? And again, don't try to get people to become Republicans. Just inspire people to vote their values. They'll figure that out later, wherever they want to be. Because we need people in both parties with a Frederick Douglass perspective. Okay, Carl, that was awesome. Excellent. Thank you. Chattanooga. <laughs> I think I'm going to go to St. Croix. <laughs> wow, that was awesome, wasn't it? Uh, but I think we've got some uh, K. Carls right in this midst, you know? I think we've got some K. Carls in this room. I'm looking at a couple of them right over here, okay? And you know who I'm talking about. But uh, Here's what we need to do tonight. A couple things I forgot to do. Well, one thing I forgot to do is uh, pass the bucket, and they're reminding me of that. So put everything you have in, your, in there except for $20, okay? Because <laughs> you've got to save $20 for his book. But seriously, I do want everyone, I don't want him to go home with a book. And, um, and if you leave some back there, I'm going to have to buy all the rest of them, okay? So please, every one of you go out with that. And I think we all need to study that. The, the, the one statement he said over and over and over again was, study to show yourself approved. Um, the other statement that I heard that stuck with me, yeah, go ahead and pass it. The, the, the other statement that stuck with me is, if you don't know the truth, you won't recognize a lie. And you know, we can think that that relates to all the other people, but I think there's probably a lot of truth that I still don't recognize, I don't know, so I don't recognize some lies from time to time. There are things I learned tonight that I didn't know. They were truths I didn't know. So I was probably believing some lies still. So I wanna encourage each one of you. Hey, Kay Carl, uh, tell me, Kay Carl, tell me of those three books that, that, uh, that Frederick Douglass wrote, was there any one of those that you would recommend that we start with to read? Read his first one. The first autobiography is entitled The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. Uh, the second book is entitled My Bondage, My Freedom. And the third and final autobiography is entitled The Life and Time of Frederick Douglass. Obviously, a written city across his life. It's very interesting to read. Okay, so the one that you want to remember, folks, is that the it's. It started with the narrative. So I would encourage you, like me, let's go out and pick up that book. But pick up this book back here, too. It'll be a good summary. And uh, we all need to give some serious considerations to some of the things he shared with us tonight. I know he has a training program that we might want to consider that as an organization. Any final thoughts or comments before we wrap up here and you spend a little time with Kate Carl? Any last thoughts? I think this is about one of the best meetings we've ever had. Yeah. Absolutely. Go ahead, Hugh. I've said for a number of years, I think the biggest failure that we've seen by conservatives, both Republicans, is the failure to articulate issues to the lowest common denominator, average guy on the street. Yeah. I think that's been the biggest failure, and he points out a, a very effective way to articulate the issues. Yeah. And also, I think, I think it's very important, lockdown particularly for certain segments of our society now with the blacks, to have a hero, to have someone to look up to, and what better than Frederick Stockwell?